Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by a Portuguese guest this time. He is Dr. Paulo Gama Mota. He is an associate professor of biology in the Department of Life Sciences of the Faculty of Science and Technology of the University of Coimbra. He is also a researcher at the Center for Research in Biodiversity and Genetic Resources at the University of Porto. Dr. Gamamota is very interested in science communication, having been a former director of the National Museum of Science and Technique, and also the Museum of Science at the, of the University of Coimbra, and also an organizer of initiatives and science communication exhibitions, as well as science, uh, citizen science projects. His areas of interest and research include animal behavior, behavioral ecology, evolutionary biology and evolutionary anthropology. So, Dr. Gamamota, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. The pleasure is mine, Ricardo. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, okay, it's great to have you on the show because, in fact, I've decided to invite you because I've read a very interesting article written by you and published in uh, Anthropologia Portuguesa, uh, uh, titled Darwin's Sexual Selection Theory, A Forgotten Idea. And since I've already had a lot of evolutionary biologists, evolutionary anthropologists, and evolutionary psychologists on the show, I mean, I love the this topic of evolutionary theory, particularly when applied to behavior and even more specifically to human behavior. So I guess that it would make a good conversation to really focus on this article of yours uh, and perhaps on the nitty gritty of it because uh, sexual selection theory is a very interesting theory that, as you said, in the article, uh, was neglected for around 100 years since Darwin first proposed it, basically. Uh, and so perhaps we could start off by talking about uh, what Darwin first said about sexual selection back in his book from 1871. The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, and perhaps then uh, uh, go step by step in talking about the things, uh, the developments that had to take place in order for us to really arrive at a fully developed sexual selection theory. So, uh, w what was the take by Darwin? So, um when, when he uh, published his uh, uh, Opus Magnum, the, um, the, the book on the on the evolution of species, uh, the Darwin was uh, uh, proposing a, a mechanism to explain the evolution of uh, adaptations, the evolution of characteristics that uh, organisms possess that increase their survival, and uh, there, there, there was a mechanism that could explain why they should evolve. And uh, when, in doing that, think, Darwin was thinking about uh, life enhancing uh, characteristics. Um, now, there are a number of characteristics that animals possess that they are not life enhancing. They are actually life hindering their survival, like, for instance, is, uh, uh, bright colorations that will increase the visibility of individuals, so would uh, make them more visible to predators and uh, um, successful for predation or long tails and other uh, traits that actually uh, make it more difficult to live with those uh, things. So, um, he, and he realized that he needed something else to explain this. So it took him a while, uh, although he published other books uh, in between, but uh, uh, 12 years after uh, the publish, uh, publication of The Origin of Species, uh, Darwin published a new book where he developed this theory, which he called uh, Sexual Selection Theory. And uh, uh, the, basically, he was saying that although uh, some traits like uh, a peacock's tail would uh, hinder the survival of the peacock, it would make uh, the peacock have more genes passed on into the next generation. Of course, Darwin was not thinking about genes because uh, the whole gene concept is a 20th century concept, but he was thinking about uh, genetic characteristics that are passed on 
and uh, he thought that uh, if females were preferring those males with longer tails, then these males would have greater success, and then the longer tails would be selected. So Darwin was thinking that this could uh, come about uh, by a competition for reproduction. And this competition for reproduction could provide some, um, um, I would say, uh, counterintuitive outcomes, which would be uh, things that would hinder the survival of individuals like uh, right correlations, uh, song, that will also call the attention to predators to the birds, and also uh, long tails. Um, and he was thinking about birds because all of these three are very uh, evident in birds, but of course they also exist in other groups of animals, uh, particularly uh, in fish um, and, and also in, uh, in, in other uh, groups, insects also, uh, and in some, some animals that actually uh, do possess uh, characteristics that um, uh, contribute to uh, competition. Particularly in mammals, uh, the competition would be more on the case of males fighting for the access of females, and then this would cause what Darwin called intersexual selection, that would be competition between individuals of one sex to access individuals of another sex. Um, and this would be most common in, in, in mammals, but of course in many other groups of animals, and would cause the evolution of uh, uh, sexual size dimorphism, uh, because then males would become much bigger uh, because they would benefit from that in species where males compete for females, because in species where females compete for males, you would expect the opposite. Um, and uh, also the evolution of uh, fighting devices like uh, horns, uh, uh, arrows, um, spears, uh, um, you know, uh, structures that uh, would um, be used or could be used for fighting. And uh, uh, so, so, so we have that uh, take by Darwin, let's say. And uh, what was the reception by other people when he put forth that idea about sexual selection? And uh, perhaps back in the 19th century, how did other biologists, for example, react to that theory of his? Okay. Um, we have to we have to assume, and that is uh, actually uh, what um, historical evidence is uh, uh, show us that Darwin was already very famous, and he was already very very recognized. So um, he had a very strong importance in terms of uh, uh, scientific thinking, not only biology but in general. Of course, he was a biologist, but uh, he was very well recognized in society. And uh, in spite of that, um, his ideas about sexual selection were not taken uh, very much seriously. Um, people accepted, uh, and, and I'm talking about biologists, uh, uh, they accepted, um, well, at the time, we would call them naturalists. Um, and they, they, they would accept the uh, intersexual selection competition because um, you would imagine that males would fight and the male wins with, will stay with the females. And uh, for um, naturalists, which were males, uh, all of them at that time, um, this made some sense. Uh, and it was uh, in line with what uh, they saw in nature and also what they saw in human society. But the mate choice thing, which is much more complicated, and actually, it's much more counterintuitive. It's more difficult to get into. Um, was not accepted for a number of reasons. Uh, one was uh, preconception. Uh, so there was, of course, uh, uh, preconception about women. Um, the all the the, the women's rights, uh, voting rights uh, fights uh, just uh, happen after, uh, just in the turning of the 19th to the 20th century. So it was a uh, a movement that happened after. So uh, women were not considered able of uh, decision to vote uh, so at that one, time. One, one big element there was the fact that Darwin lived uh, 
in a Victorian society and the, and the cultural environment back then was very misogynist and against women and it was very difficult for people particularly in a male dominated environment like the sciences were and particularly biology or naturalism back then to accept perhaps female agency right? absolutely uh, that was a, a big uh, issue um, certainly assuming that uh, uh, even that females from another species who could have uh, uh, ability to make uh, decisions uh, about uh, um, interests on mates was considered uh, just an appalling thought um, although Darwin was very careful on that and is uh, in his text is uh, is always saying that uh, is he says in a very uh, specific passage that uh, I am not uh, assuming that uh, females consciously deliberate. Um, I'm he was talking about uh, females of another species, uh, but that they, they are more excited um, or they're more uh, um, in tuned um, by the most uh, melodious, the most gallant, uh, or the most uh, beautiful males or the brightest males. Um, so he, he was uh, very, very careful about that. He was saying, my mechanism will work uh, without any kind of uh, consciousness, conscious thinking about this thing. And I think... And, and, and that's a very interesting part there, because nowadays we really know that most of these cognitive uh, mental mechanisms operate at a subconscious level. So that was a great insight by, by him. It was. Well, right? I, 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 it is my belief that um, Darwin, um, he had a mind which was very, um, I would say, very much analytical for, uh, for, his, uh, for his time. Mm -hmm. um, he, he had a population thinking, a populational thinking, which most of uh, naturalists did not have at his time. And many of his ideas were not fully understood because they did not uh, uh, carry a populational thinking. They were thinking about a species as a block. Uh, they, they were not they were thinking, thinking of a species about... as a they were thinking about what people call uh, for the good of the species that is absolutely like that nowadays is debunked in evolutionary biology right and, and he, he was he, he, he was thinking differently and because of that he managed to reach to some conclusions that was that were very 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 far away from the way of thinking of his contemporaries and i think the sexual selection theory particularly the part related with my choice um, um, I think it was uh, one of these uh, um, hunting, hunting wolf wasps um, that just visit my, uh, I, th I think it was an African wasp actually, um, visiting my, uh, my office, I'm um, sorry. Um, and um, his, uh, um, his, his thinking was um, uh, particularly the, the mate choice uh, part, which is uh, females choosing uh, males' characteristics in most of the species, uh, because again, where there is sex role reversal, you would expect that males will develop those characteristics and females will, uh, um, I'm sorry, females will develop those characteristics and male will be, males will be the choosy sex. So um, it will be reversed in the sense that perhaps the exaggerated characteristics that we get in males in a lot of species, in species where that's reversed, those exaggerated characteristics are found in females. Exactly. And uh, of course, there are, there are a number of cases uh, of that now known. Um, and the, this idea was really not accepted. It was very, very difficult for... Uh, the preconceptions, but also because it required thinking about selection on traits. And of course, the, the, the whole theory of natural selection was not being formalized. There was no formal ways of uh, the, the mathematics of it just appeared in the 1930s with uh, Ronald Fisher, Aldane, Sewell Wright, which were really the guys who uh, merge the, the, the Mendelian uh, theory of inheritance, uh, now we can say uh, merging genetics with selection in order to show that how things could be selected, um, that is, uh, traits that have a genetic basis, how they can be selected because the genes uh, 
are passed on, and the, and so the characteristics will be expressed uh, uh, in in the in future generations, um, in, uh, depending on the genes that, of course, are being passed on, and how the, the proportion of genes changes from generation to generation. So all of this theory only developed in the 1930s. Um, uh, that is uh, more than 50 years after Darwin uh, formalized this concept. And, and that's ma that makes Darwin's insights even more remarkable because he, did, he didn't know at all about genetics and he didn't know at all about any mechanism of passing traits between individuals throughout the generations and things like that. I mean, he didn't know at all how those things worked. He was working at a very superficial, uh, phenotypic level. Right? Yeah, but what is amazing about him uh, and what, what makes him so, uh, so special was uh, is that he was thinking in the right way. He caught uh, the correct thinking in a very deep sense since the beginning. And, and this made, um, made him uh, just advance the theory. And, uh, and of course, the sexual selection theory is actually an advancement of the natural selection theory. Uh, we know that uh, natural sele uh, sexual selection is not um, different. There is not a different mechanism in uh, sexual selection operating from natural selection is a form of natural selection that is related with sex and uh, reproduction. Um, but of course, um, we needed the development of mathematics and even the, the idea of um, um, the, the whole idea of game theory and the possibility of uh, 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 alternative reproductive strategies. This also helped to understand uh, that um, there might be competition uh, within a species. Individuals will all be, not be all, all, all the same and they, they can have uh, a number of different uh, strategies that they can uh, uh, use to try to increase their reproductive success. Um, and all of that was in a sense, well, I wouldn't say about uh, the alternative reproductive strategies, but for all of the rest, um, it was already in Darwin's thinking because he did um, capture the function, the functioning of the whole process in the right way since the beginning, um, which I think was not accompanied by uh, all of his uh, fellows and for many years. Uh, and actually, I think um, uh, the only exception was uh, Fisher, who in the 1930s decided to try to test this idea of Darwin, of my choice. So he developed a model who is now known as the Fisherian model, uh, uh, just uh, in, in homage to uh, Ronald Fisher. Um, so he just basically tried to see if females like males with longer tails, um, and if they pass on these to their daughters, and if they mate with males with longer tails, and uh, their sons will inherit uh, longer tails, and the, and the daughters will prefer with males with longer tails, whether these will uh, be selected in, in, in the future. And uh, he, he showed that uh, that was possible. But this was the only exception for a whole century, which is absolutely um, incredible. So only in the 1970s, you start to get interest on this topic again. And that is uh, 100, year, 100 years after Darwin. And it became one of the most successful uh, theories of Darwin because uh, sexual selection now allows us to explain a huge number of uh, characteristics and traits uh, possessed by animals and not only animals. Uh, also, you can find some, some, some uh, sexual selection um, to a certain extent uh, or at least related with animals uh, in, in plants, but uh, mostly you will find it in, uh, in, in animals. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so just before we talk about modern sexual selection theory and the many ramifications that it has and the many uh, applications, let's say, let's just take a step back. Uh, 
to clarify some concepts here that might be important for the public to understand. And I guess that we've already referred to genetics and the gene here, and I guess that it would be very important for people to know and to understand that, and please correct, correct me if I say something wrong here or if I take any misstep, but basically... Uh, nowadays, uh, evolutionary biology is very focused on the gene as the unit of selection, and particularly since uh, Richard Dawkins published the selfish, the selfish gene uh, tw uh, 42 years ago, I think, uh, p people have been focusing a lot on the gene, and I guess that it is very important to not take the analogy that Dawkins made very literally because, I mean, it is very easy for people to start thinking about evolutionary biology and evolutionary processes as being somewhat directed, as, a, as some agency operating on them and as having some purpose. But basically what it boils down to is the fact that there are different individuals with different genes that predispose them to different behaviors and preferences and perhaps the ones that really lead them, in this case, to select um, mates or partners that have the best characteristics that really allow for them uh, to reproduce more and to leave more descendants with better prospects of survival, those are the ones that increase in frequency in a given population and that's why over time certain characteristics get selected and in the case of the sex that, that is under uh, intersexual selection, let's say in many cases it's the males, in some cases it's the females, uh, uh, where characteristics get exaggerated and really might be, might hinder their, uh, their fitness, right? Is, is all of this correct or? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> there's a, a whole number of questions. <laughs> um, um, I, I, let me start by, um, I think you did work right. Let me start by giving examples about uh, why um, thinking about things on the interests of the species um, usually drives us to think wrongly about uh, the evolution of, of, uh, of things. Uh, for instances, in the 1980s, um, um, and a, a, a primatologist, uh, a female primatologist, uh, Sarah Herdi, was uh, studying uh, langurs in uh, India. And, uh, and she found that uh, langur males sometimes, when there was a takeover uh, for, a, for a polygynous harem, um, male would kill, the male who wins the, the, the new harem would kill the, the young. So that was infanticide. And um, she said that this was an adapt adaptive strategy for the males. And uh, she was very, very much criticized at the time. So it took a lot of uh, effort for people to come into terms, into understanding that they were thinking wrongly about this. Um, and to accept that actually these males were uh, doing things to enhance their own survival. And why do they announce their own survival? Well, because when females have young, they are lactating. And, and because of that, they will not ovulate. And because not ovulating, they will not be uh, producing young for this new male. Now, if the male kills the other young, uh, the females will start to ovulate. And you will say, well, that is not very nice, but uh, uh, nature is not nice. or not or uh, a nice nature is just nature um, and uh, you can find any uh, all examples that you wish on uh, uh, in, in nature um, what what is at stake here is that if this behavior benefits males and if males can enforce this kind of behavior and of course what happens is that females cannot prevent these males from killing their young 
because this is not beneficial for females. This is so certainly not beneficial for the species, because if there was interest of the species, as it was common understanding and common knowledge throughout the whole 20th century, I'm not just even talking about the 19th century, throughout the whole 20th century until the 1970s and 1980s, um, then you would accept that uh, 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 infanticide would be um, counter-selected, it would, should be eliminated, and it, if it happened, it would be something, some sort of uh, abnormal kind of behavior that these males were having. Now, we know that nothing of that happens. Uh, and actually, uh, primates are a group of, uh, of mammals where uh, infanticide is very common. Um, now, you can only explain that if you think of individual strategies, not on the good of the species. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1960s, another problem was on the table. Um, because a guy who was just uh, very, very bright, had this uh, fantastic idea, he wanted to work on uh, a conundrum, a problem that Darwin never solved uh, although he, he, he mentioned that, it was the problem of altruism. How do you explain that individuals, individuals sacrifice themselves to save others? Because if they sacrifice themselves, they will not pass on their genes. Or uh, sacrifice to help others to breed. Um, so the genes that uh, enforce this kind of behavior would be uh, counter-selected and they would be eliminated. So um, how these behaviors could have evolved? And, and uh, is, Hamilton, it, is it is it when we get into kin selection? Is it is it is when we get into kin selection? It is when we get into the the gene level of analysis of selection. So the the switch that we got is uh, because um, two two very bright guys, uh, um, um, uh, George Williams uh, in the U.S and Bill Hamilton in the UK um, developed independently this idea of uh, looking into selection at the level of genes to see uh, if some traits that are difficult to explain at the level of individuals or thinking of uh, individual uh, fitness um, would be selected. And uh, they have shown, um, although it took a long time for people to accept, Particularly Hamilton, he had a terrible time. Uh, he, he was not accepted in the most prestigious universities in the UK. He had to immigrate to the US, um, and it took um, 20 years, more than 20 years, uh, until Oxford offered him um, a, a position uh, when he was already a celebrity. Um, and wasn't there also some conflict between William Hamilton and John Maynard Smith when it comes to the one that first proposed the kin selection theory, or, or not? Or am I wrong here? I, I, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of that. Well, p perhaps I've read it somewhere, but, but it's not... Uh, really, I don't know. No, I'm not... Oh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, yeah, yeah be because there was that paper published by Hamilton in 1963 or 64, where he talks specifically about kin selection, uh, and it seems tha that uh, perhaps uh, people are not sure if it was Hamilton that first came up with the idea that he really focuses on on that paper or if it was John Maynard Smith. But I, I mean, perhaps th this is just something that people came up with. I don't know. Uh, no, uh, because um, I, don't, I, I don't remember of reading uh, articles of uh, John Maynard Smith uh, in, at that early time. Mm. Uh, so, because I, I, he became more attached to biology. I, I, I don't know his biography, but uh, my readings of, of John Maynard Smith started in uh, 1970s, not 1960s. And so, he is more associated with game theory. With right? game theory. He introduced that uh, with uh, George Price, he introduced the concept of game theory to, to, to biology, uh, to the behavior. But uh, continuing to, to, to answer your question, so 
Now we know, uh, and when we started to think about genes as possible units of selection, we started to be capable of not only explaining some behaviors, but also to discover new things which were uh, unknown, like the, the whole concept of selfish gene uh, that was uh, possible to find. And um, so the second part of your question is related with, um, now are we always thinking about genes? No, we are not always thinking about genes. Um, um, there is a, a philosopher uh, of biology who did put this in a very nice way. Um, if uh, uh, the interests, uh, or I'm, I'm talking about the evolutionary interests, not the interests that we uh, usually say uh, that consciously we have, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm just talking in, in terms of uh, evolutionary interests, which means that something that increases the fitness of um, either the gene or the individual or the population or the group or the species, okay? So uh, yeah, per perhaps it's also important here to introduce the topic of approximate versus ultimate explanations for behavior because I mean no 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 not necessarily oh no. Okay, okay okay no not not necessarily um, so um, if something is beneficial for the gene and for the, the individual who carries that gene mm -hmm. like uh, for instance is uh, going out to find food and be very efficient in finding food that is good for the individual who has a good strategy. And as it is also uh, good for the gene, who also, uh, um, uh, the gene that, or genes that contribute to make the individual uh, being better at procuring food. Mm -hmm. You cannot disentangle genes from individuals. And uh, in evolutionary thinking, you can either think about the gene or the individual because the result will be the same. Mm -hmm. Now, when the interests of individuals and genes get into conflict, mm -hmm. you see that there is a more powerful uh, level of selection at lower levels than at higher levels, because usually the lower levels will take the advantage to the higher levels. So people, if they are thinking of the, of the interest of the species, uh, they usually be right, although not for the good reasons, because in general, what is good for the individuals is good for the species. Mm -hmm. Unless it is not. And when it is not, you will see that the selection is going, is going on at the level of individuals, not at the level of species. Mm -hmm. And the same is true when you're talking about individuals in relation to genes. So if the interests of the genes and the individuals are the same, you will not see any difference. Only when they get in conflict, you will realize that it is the genes that have more power to make the selection go in the direction that benefits uh, genes that cause a certain behavior uh, and not and even even if that is uh, uh, is uh, um, is um, hindering individual survival and that is the case of uh, altruism in general and of course uh, infanticide is the case uh, for explaining that uh, selection at the level individual is much stronger than at the level of the group or at that the interest of the species usually uh, takes you in to make uh, wrong uh, conclusions. Mm -hmm. But um, what is more common now is to accept that selection can occur at several levels, not and just the, one. The multi-level selection. Multi-level of... selection. Although uh, selection at higher levels will be very uncommon. The highest level, the more uncommon it will be. Um, so you will expect that uh, selection at level of group, group selection, which has been very uh, 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 on debate about uh, human evolution, because we are, we are a very social species. Um, we tend to share things like a football team or the flag or um, an anthem or a number of ideas or a religion, which will make you to be uh, more friendly or more uh, capable of uh, being uh, helpful to people who share uh, your own tag, uh, your cultural tag, than uh, to other people who do not share that particular cultural tag with you. Um, and it, this has been discussed that group selection was probably working uh, very heavily in human evolution. And there is a debate on that now. But in general, um, you would see that group selection is very, very rare. 
Um, very, very. And most of the explanations can be across uh, different species. Across different species. Mm, okay. And and most of the explanations will occur if you think about individual selection or at at, at uh, gene selection. Uh, so, uh, about group selection, because th that is a very contentious topic, isn't it the case that most biologists or biologists in general that do work in evolution uh, reject group selection for the most part? Because, I mean, there are some very prominent people, like, for example, David Sloan Wilson, and more recently, Edward O. Wilson, that accept group selection at least to explain certain traits in certain species, like humans. But, uh, in general, isn't it the case that most people reject it? Well, I, I, I think... Um we, uh, we became uh, convinced by the very powerful arguments that uh, George Williams and, uh, and um, uh, Bill Hamilton, and after that also John Maynard Smith, made uh, towards, and of course, a uh, very, very influential book uh, to biological thinking, which was uh, uh, The Southeast Gene by Richard mm -hmm. Dawkins. All of that made a very strong case to thinking about the evolution at the level of genes, uh, and uh, and it has it, it was so successful, so successful that um, thinking differently or having a different possibility seemed to most of us like uh, here we go back into uh, the the interest of the species thinking and all and all of that. Um, and, uh, and I think that there was a, a negative reaction uh, for a long time uh, because it was taken as uh, uh, now we are just uh, coming back into all ideas which are uh, most likely wrong. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, uh, and even we have a more, I think, complicated movement, which was um, the... the the, the James Lovelock uh, thinking on Gaia as uh, the Earth uh, being uh, uh, a kind of conscious system who made uh, decisions to keep uh, the Earth a uh, stable, um, uh, enormous ecosystem. Um, it, it was as if it was by itself an organism. Yes. Um, and, and, and of course, all of that uh, made people very, very... Uh, um, cautious and, uh, and negative about uh, thinking on the possibility that group select selection could work. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there were theoretical developments, and these theoretical developments, uh, they have shown that um, group selection can work in some circumstances, very restricted circumstances. Mm -hmm. You need, um, it, will, it will be slow, much slower than the other processes, and that's why, why it makes it so difficult to, uh, to be important in evolutionary terms. Um, and also, it means that uh, the, you cannot have uh, migration between groups. So you, you need to prevent migration between groups. Now, humans are good at, at uh, although humans are good at migrating, they are also good at preventing migration bet between cultural groups because of the cultural tags. Um, I was very much impressed um, reading uh, last year the David uh, Reich book uh, about uh, uh, the evolutionary past of humans. There was a chapter on India and on the, the evolutionary genetics, uh, uh, human uh, evolutionary history in India. And what they found was that there were populations living in the same area that were separated by more than 2,000 years, and uh, which is the caste system, the caste system in India, that we know that is going on. Uh, we did not know where did it came from, but it appears to be very, very old. And actually, humans are the only species where individuals can live in the same territory and, uh, and not interbreed because of cultural reasons. So, if this could happen in India, it could happen in other moments in our evolutionary history, 
which means that we have the capability of having this uh, cultural segregation between groups. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then it is possible that group selection could have played a role in the evolution of some characteristics of, uh, of humans. So um, I think this is more, more acceptable now. Uh, and I think people are using uh, all possibilities when they're analyzing um, uh, how these particular uh, group of uh, populations evolve or how these particular trait evolved in, uh, in human populations. Uh, was it based on individual selection? Uh, like, for instance, this cooperation. Was it based on individual selection? Was it based on kin selection, that is, genes? Um, um, and I, we did not explain what is kin, kin selection, but kin selection is actually an acronym for selection of the level of genes, where individuals um, are altruists toward others, but toward their kin. And because they're keen having have a greater ability, uh, uh, probability of carrying the same gene that is making them to be altruistic, mm -hmm. then the gene for altruism will increase uh, in the next generation because individual is not breathing but is helping uh, his mother, for instance, is like in bees, um, to, uh, to produce more young than uh, the individual would be capable of doing alone. And because of that, he is actually, or she in this case, um, contributing to uh, put more, more of their genes, um, uh, of its genes in the next generation than if just by breathing alone. So kin selection is a way of explaining uh, selection at the level of gene, the gene when you are benefit, benefiting your kin. So it's, it, it uh, has to do basically with genetic relatedness. It has to do with genetic relatedness and to an analysis of, uh, of uh, the evolution of any trait uh, at the level of the gene. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually gene selection. And I think that um, there, are, there are a number of uh, uh, um, ideas now going on that um, I think um, we became more um, uh, capable of accepting that uh, selection can occur at uh, more than one level. And mm -hmm. uh, group selection is not the explanation for all. Uh, it will always be uh, the most uh, difficult and more requiring conditions kind of uh, selection. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it can work in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things there to untangle. Let's start with this, because at a certain point there you refer to different cultural groups, basically. So uh, when you refer to group selection there, were you making a distinction that some people make as well between cultural group selection and genetic group selection? Because, I mean, it could be perhaps two things here. Were you referring to the fact that perhaps there are some aspects of culture and that culture works as a second layer of evolution, let's say above uh, biological evolution, uh, that uh, where really people can use certain mechanisms that piggyback on biological ones, like, for example, cultural group identity, for them to form relations among them and to work effectively as a group, and then that would be cultural group selection. Or were you referring to the fact that there are some individuals that, or some populations that, because they have the same group identity, they separate from one another and perhaps evolve in different natural niches and, and are exposed to different selective pressures and then uh, two different groups would evolve and that would be genetic selection. I mean, what were you really referring to there? Um, can we just uh, make a zoom out mm -hmm. and go... Uh, into thinking um, on biological systems. Right. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, what, what keeps a biological system working is, um, is information mm -hmm. that warrants uh, 
that uh, the, the very complex system of a cell uh, works well, which is a marvelous uh, thing um, and depends mostly on, on information. So uh, very, very early on, uh, evolution, the evolution of organisms, uh, it appeared a system, a very robust system, uh, to uh, keep this information capacity on, which was the replicators. So the first replicators probably were RNA molecules. And then it appeared DNA, which is a double-stranded kind of uh, RNA, which is immensely more stable. So much more stable, so stable that uh, you can even find uh, parts of DNA on fossils with more than 100,000 years, which is um, absolutely incredible. So it's a very, very stable molecule. And uh, the, the basic property of DNA is just to be copied and passed on. And uh, it, it is also a bookkeeping system. It's where the information for most of the functioning of the organism is stored. And, and this worked for a long, 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 long time. Mm -hmm. So at a certain moment, uh, a special kind of cells evolved, neurons. And neurons had this possibility of uh, making connections between themselves and by firing in together or in conjunction, and we are just uh, learning about this, um, are capable of uh, storing information also. So this information is stored in the network of the neurons of uh, one individual. Uh, and uh, uh, the possibility of these neurons is that individuals can learn with their environment. And they can also learn observing others. And if they have uh, sufficient uh, brain power, they will, can, they will observe what the others can do and, and benefit from that and, and change their own behavior. Uh, learning to make a tool is something that uh, in many cases we have to do. Okay, um, um, when you buy something that, to, that has to be built, you need a, a set of instructions because otherwise you will make a lot of mistakes. Anyone who bought some kind of uh, item from uh, IKEA or uh, any other uh, big uh, manufacturer that sells these things by, uh, by pieces uh, knows that uh, you need instructions. And, and for a long, long, long uh, evolutionary time, this kind of uh, uh, knowledge has been passed from brain to brain. And actually, Darwin, uh, sorry, Dawkins talks about that in the, in the selfish gene. The last part of his book is about a parallel kind of evolution, which will be cultural evolution, or in the in human case, or which we can apply to some other species, but which I would generalize to say that will be evolution of ideas, evolution that passed on from brain to brain. It requires that individuals interact with others. And uh, for it to become really impressive, you need social societies, you need social species, where, which have a big brain, so they have uh, lots of neurons that are capable of storing a lot of information. And this information will interact and will change the individual behavior. So now we have two kinds of factors that will influence the behavior of individuals. Their own genes, and the ideas, the structure of their bi uh, brain, which is also partially genetically determined, but it is also the result of their own experience and the things that they have seen, the things that they have learned, and they have stored and organized in specific ways in their own brains, which will affect their behavior. So now you have two kinds of things that will affect the behavior. So I will not say that uh, applying this, okay, now we're gonna, going to apply this to the human uh, cultural evolution. What I would think about is that cultural evolution is not above or below uh, biological evolution. It's just a parallel thing which will affect biological evolution as well as biological evolution will affect cultural evolution. So uh, because of some biological constraints, some uh, things will be more difficult to evolve in the evolution of ideas in the, in the environment of uh, ideas in evolution. And on the other hand, uh, some uh, cultural restraints will affect the biological evolution. And of course, the caste system 
uh, I, I don't know exactly how the, the English pronounce this, cast of caste system. Uh, it's caste system. Yeah. It's caste. Caste, yes. The caste system uh, is a very typical uh, uh, cultural case for affecting uh, uh, genetics and uh, population genetics and, of course, biological evolution. Um, and there are other examples, like, for instance, is uh, the habit of uh, some populations in, uh, in New Guinea, for instance, is to eat the brains of their enemies after they're fighting them, uh, which is a way of honoring uh, the warriors, but it also passes on uh, um, human encephalopathy, which, which is named Kuru uh, uh, there, uh, but it's a brain encephalopathy. Um, and it is passed on because of that. So um, a cultural habit that hinders biological survival. So it, and this can happen in many circumstances. Um, and I think we are now having um, robust um, mathematical formalism, both in biological evolution and in cultural evolution, particularly uh, after the work of um, Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson, who did an enormous work uh, uh, testing ideas on uh, cultural evolution, so that we can uh, just uh, bridge them together and see how they're intertwining, okay? In many cases, you will have the selection of ideas that benefit also uh, the biology, and that why cultural is so adaptive and how, uh, and you, you can see how without uh, the right culture, uh, the environment can be very unfriendly to you. So people can die just by eating the wrong food. And this has happened uh, once and then one and then, and then another time again and again and again, just because we didn't have in a certain environment the, the right culture. Mm -hmm. So when you are adept, culturally adapted to an environment, everything seems so easy. Uh, and you see that it is not easy when actually you are coming to a new environment which you, do not know, you don't know the right signs and you don't know how to act in that environment. It shows you how important it is cultural adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically all of the things that you are referring to there when you say that biology and culture interact with one another is what people like, for example, Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson call a gene culture coevolution, right? And perhaps even uh, the fact that culture uh, might influence how genetic evolution occurs over time, it is related to the fact that through culture we can also create create new environments that by themselves exert new evolutionary pressures on us and there are examples like for example the ability to digest milk uh, and and yes. things like that right exactly exactly um, there, there has been um, I don't know actually the, the authors of this idea um, I don't remember the names uh, but um, it has been uh, uh, around for a while uh, the, the idea of cu uh, culture uh, of uh, niche, niche creation. Mm -hmm. So um, um, a species creates its own niche in a sense because um, it can change the, 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 the environment. And by changing the environment, it's, it's not just filling a niche, it's also creating uh, a new niche, changing things. And of course, a cultural species has much more ability to do that because it's more capable of interacting with the environment. And of course, um, humans, which are the most ubiquitous vertebrates, which the greatest biomass of any other vertebrate species is uh, that ubiquitous, as so many individuals um, that we, of course, now fighting uh, with, um, we are struggling with difficulties because we are so many uh, and we, we consume so many resources. Um, all of that success of our species is because um, we have been capable of culturally adapting. Um, and I think when you look into um, what was the, the conquest of Earth by the first humans that left Earth, uh, and I'm talking about modern humans, so I'm talking about the last 100,000 years, uh, it seems like it was a rush 
you know, they, they were just moving around. Of course, the populations were not moving around, they were settling. But because they were breeding quickly, they were producing lots of young, uh, they were spreading out. And of course, they were not filling all the territory. They were just occupying the best places, usually near the sea uh, or uh, at rivers, but particularly close to the to the to the um, to the to the coast, because there were, there's a lot of seafood there, and they can uh, they can feed on that. And you will find even the colonization of America, South America, for instance, it's very obvious that it was mostly colonized by by the outside, not the inside. The inside took much longer. And this was common in all uh, human um, spread out uh, because uh, they already uh, managed to control the, the, the good production of spare heads. Uh, they certainly had an arch uh, to reach out uh, to, to, to pick up prey uh, far away and also um, other instruments that they could, could use. They could process part of their food um and they had changes in their uh, in their uh, in their um it's it is a very very uh, obvious uh, evolutionary modification uh, the the feeding um of humans because uh, the teeth and all the the mandible um uh, the, the, they, the, the two mandibles they have changed um uh, the two maxillas uh they have changed uh, so much so with so much individuation uh, for each kind of uh, tooth uh, for a particular function um, that uh, it reveals a very uh, uh, lots of modifications in the diet and all of that is because we invented fire we managed to pass that in, that information passed on uh, we made a, not, a number of inventions which were cultural inventions and uh, uh, in one way or another uh, they were passed on uh, to others uh, either by copying uh, by imitation, um, which is uh, uh, pretty much incredible because it's so easy to lose the knowledge uh, if it is not shared, if it is not practiced. That is really, uh, for me, it is quite amazing that for how so long um, all of these kind of uh, inventions were passed on. And I think there, there is another thing which was the greatest human evolutionary uh, event that changed the whole thing, which was language, mm -hmm. which is the possibility of explaining things, of talking about things, mm -hmm. which increases enormously uh, this capability because you can uh, store information in stories, uh, stories that are told or stories that are sung. And uh, a lot of knowledge can be passed on uh, through that, uh, that way and, uh, and that makes uh, the evolution of our species very special on that respect. Mm -hmm. So let me just take a step back because uh, when I asked you about group selection, uh, I perhaps talked about biology and culture in a way that I it is basically not the best, uh, the most correct way to put it because I basically put culture above biology and you made that clarification that they are uh, two parallel parallel processes occurring at the same time in humans and also perhaps in other species in a more rudimentary way perhaps and uh, perhaps in my head I put uh, culture about biology because isn't it the case that in order for us to have culture and that's also the reason why many other species lack it is that we have to have set in place certain cognitive mechanisms that we have acquired through uh, genetic selection, let's say, like, for example, the ability to imitate one another, a theory of mind, and then also you referred to Boyd and Richardson, and in their work they talk about certain biases that are important for us to understand how we communicate culture, cultural information to one another, 
rather like the context based biases and the content based ones like for example there are certain kinds of information that are more easily memorized by us and more easily transmitted and perhaps we look toward certain types of people to acquire information from them like the most popular people the most successful ones the older people the ones that are part of our own own gender as well so i i guess that perhaps i didn't put it in a good enough way but that's the reason why i was putting it like that that uh, that perhaps we need all of those uh, biological cognitive processes that give base to culture um. yes um it is true that uh, you you need uh, um, a specific biology to have uh, uh, certain cognitive abilities because the cognitive abilities depend on the brain mm -hmm. and the brain is structured by the genetic information uh, that structured that brain brain so um, in the f in the first place in order to reach a certain cognitive level you will need to have a particular biology and actually you will need a selection that favors the evolution of that particular brain but even during that process uh, of uh, selection of a particular brain uh, you are already selecting um, that brain because of the outcomes uh, so some characteristics of the brain will be over uh, inflated in relation to others. Like if you are a very visual species, you will have, a, you will, and that, and it depends a lot of, on visual information, you will hand, uh, enhance the visual processing thing. And uh, uh, maybe you will lose um, capabilities with other senses, uh, as it was the case, as it is the case of, the, of smell for us. So your brain is, is also changing uh, because of your biology. But when you are, when we are talking about um, uh, the, inter the much modern interactions uh, between brain and behavior and culture, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, more. It is a better framework not to think on a level kind of thing, but uh, uh, an interacting kind of uh, uh, two evo two parallel evolutions. Why? Because uh, cultural evolution does not depend on biological evolution. It can evolve much faster and actually the rules are different because in biology you can only inherit in general terms from your parents. Mm -hmm. But in cultural evolution you can inherit from your peers, from your parents and also from older people who are not your parents. So you have a uh, much richer inheritance uh, kind of system, which is actually parallel to the biological evolution. Also, it changes much quicker. So cultural evolution is much faster. And you see, we see it now, okay? Every time my, uh, I change mobile phone, I have to learn a number of things, which at the first they look uh, stupid to me and I don't understand how they work and I have to go through uh, the, that process. Um, and and, and uh, for children, it's much more easy uh, because they had been working on that environment in, uh, in, in other environments, uh, in the internet or using other devices. So uh, when it comes to uh, a mobile phone, for instance, it's, it's, it's just an extension of something that they have already experienced, whereas for me it is not, which, um, and of course, we all know that uh, we are struggling with um, with uh, very complex uh, problems. Um, and I think for the first time in the history of humanity, we are facing global problems that can only be solved globally, which is something that we have never tried before. So, and I think n n not, not a single species has ever had this kind of challenge. And I don't know if we are going to be up to it, uh, but we know, I think it's, it's becoming clear uh, to all of us that we have a challenge that is not solved by simple ideas because it's a very complex challenge that requires very complex kind of solutions.
and um, we will need uh, a, 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 um, a global cooperation. But uh, in order to just coming back uh, to what you were saying, um, um, cultural and biological evolution will influence each other. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, for instance, if certain mutations appear that favor uh, certain environments, those uh, mutations may be selected very quickly in, in, in certain environments. And these can change also habits, like uh, the example that you mentioned for the ability of humans to drink uh, milk when adults. Um, which is a very uncommon thing in mammals um, and, and actually it's very uncommon in humans also because the majority of humans do not process milk and they are capable incapable of processing milk uh, in adults although there, there are only certain very specific populations like for example northern Europeans well and, in Europe and, all, all over Europe you have uh, even in southern Europe about 40 percent of the of people are capable of processing uh, milk so they, they carry this mutation and in Africa there are two other mutations and uh, in there is a, f a fourth uh, mutation that is known in um, East in Asia. Asia for example yeah uh, and all of them were selected in, uh, in uh, populations who were uh, having uh, cattle. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, um, the po maybe the mutation did not appear there, but uh, it was there that was selective, selective advantage, right? because they, they, could, um, they could have access to a, f to a food source that was very, very good. But even 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 although this changed uh, uh, the the ability of adapt for a lot of human populations, culturally humans use different strategies like uh, processing milk, which decreases the amount of uh, lactose that is in the milk, and so we can uh, process more like using yogurt or cheese or cheese, which is a way of uh, uh, culturally taking advantage of a resource in order to adapt and have uh, uh, proper food available um, and, and in case of cheese very stable for a long time yeah which it's is always a big problem for, for, for additional populations Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that you are referring to food preparation because that's another example of how culture worked to produce, let's say, certain pieces of technology, let's call them that culinary technology, for example, that really allow for us to increase our fitness, like, for example, in countries closer to the equator, to the earth equator, uh, people use more spices also to fight higher levels of parasite stress there, right? Well, the, the, the spices are mostly used to kill the parasites in the food. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I was saying basically that because they are more exposed to parasites, that's the reason why they developed uh, that sort of culinary practice. Well, uh, uh, and... Um the, 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 there is not exactly a threshold, but of course, uh, as, as you approach the 38 degrees, 37 degrees, um, all food degrades much, much, much faster. So if you are processing food at 15 degrees, that is fine. It can take uh, hours and hours and days with no problem. And if you try to do the same thing at 30, 35, 36, 37 degrees, you just um, uh, go into troubles because the food degrades very fast. Because of course, uh, microorganisms um, they have a, a exponential uh, a curve of uh, activity related with temperature, and of course, uh, then food degrades much faster. And and it's uh, it's an example of uh, of cultural adaptation uh, that has been proposed. Um, the use of uh, spices in uh, in countries where the food is uh, degrading faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me just ask you perhaps a final question, because I think that we can't leave this conversation without addressing this point here that has to do with uh, the fact that certain disciplines developed uh, 
uh, after the 70s, particularly like sociobiology, evolutionary psychology, human behavioral ecology and things like that. And I think that I would like to ask you, uh, what would you tell people to perhaps uh, call them, uh, calm them down when it comes to their accepting the fact that perhaps there are at least certain aspects of our human behavior uh, that really have a biological slash evolutionary basis? Because I guess that back when these disciplines were developed, and particularly in the 70s, because we were going through the cultural and social revolutions, people, the, uh, these kinds of ideas didn't really get a good reception because people were still thinking about many different sorts of discrimination and the idea of certain aspects of our behavior being innate uh, I mean it was really controversial so uh, I, I mean what would you tell people to perhaps uh, uh, turn it easier for them to accept uh, these sorts of ideas wow uh, <laughs> thank you for the very difficult question uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, I think um, that uh, those uh, wrong conceptions um, about uh, us being uh, special and about us being free from uh, our biology, they are still around. Uh, they, have, they haven't gone away. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, even in, in academia, there are people thinking uh, that way, uh, which is, of course, wrong because we are a biological system. Um, and of course, anyone who goes to the doctor knows that we are a biological system. Um, now, people think that although we are a biological system, our biology is just about the working of the machine and that our thoughts do not depend on the machine. And of course, that is wrong also because our thoughts are in our brain, are the product, the product of activity of our brain, which is a biological system, which is actually the product of an evolutionary history. And uh, when we see a snake, we have fear. And our amygdala will fire in the same way as another monkey or another mammal. Because, and, and not only, uh, because the amygdala is a very ancient evolutionary uh, system that is uh, present uh, what, what it, it, it's part of a, a thing that we call the limbic system and it's very ancient in evolutionary terms and it's very important uh, in life preserving uh, behavior of individuals so our behavior is very much biological uh, which does not mean that we are not uh, uh, capable of making uh, conscious decisions, although even the conscious decision sometimes is being called into question because uh, some, in some cases there were some studies with MRIs uh, suggesting that uh, the brain has made the decision because before we made consciousness, we took consciousness of, of, of it, which is uh, quite puzzling. Um, and uh, I think uh, the other thing is that we should take a, 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 a more humble attitude towards nature. nature. Now, we tend to look into other species as being just uh, damp animals. We are the very bright. Now we know that other species are capable of doing things and, uh, and we have to pay homage to all uh, behavioral biologists, uh, whatever the discipline, that studied uh, parrots, monkeys, uh, primates, chimpanzees, um, other animals, uh, uh, crows, uh, corvids, uh, um, whatever. Um, and they, they have shown pigeons. And they have shown that in, in many of these species, there are capabilities that are not so different from ours. Um, uh, things uh, that involve uh, discrimination concepts, uh, that involve um, the ability of counting. We are not very good at counting either. 
Uh, we think that we are, we are very good at counting. We are not very good at counting. Um, um, we, we, we have the same kind of search images, uh, strategies in our brain that other animals uh, use. Just give you an example. Um, if you are searching for a certain object uh, that you lost, uh, and you, you start to search in a field, and you just have an image of that ob object in your, in your mind. Um, so you, you are using a search image for that object. Now, if you lost two objects, and these objects are different, uh, you will lose the ability uh, to find the right object. So the ability that you will, f uh, the probability that you will find either of it will decay enormously because uh, your brain is just struggling with two images uh, and you are not so well at having the two images at the same time as just searching for, a, for one. Now, uh, um, say um, uh, birds that eat moths were tested on this kind of, uh, of problem and they've shown the right kind of problem that we have. It's much more easy for them to search for a certain kind of object than to search for two different kinds of objects. So we share with other animals a number of uh, things that show that there is a continuum, an evolutionary continuum. Uh, and of course, we are all biology and we are also very cultural, but um, the two of them are very much intertwined. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Gamamot, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be on the show again. Would you like to make reference to perhaps some places on the internet where people can find your work? Well, um, well, m m most most of my work is is um, you know, well, if it can be it, it can be searched in. Uh, research gate uh, but, but that is just uh, a close for people who, who are in that network the the, the website of the the, the cbo uh, my research institute uh, is um it, it has uh, some of my uh, papers and of course if you just google uh, on my name um, some of the articles or uh, will will come about of course uh, we have this problem that um, not, not all, uh, many, many of the scientists' work is uh, binded by um, uh, pro uh, intellectual property restrictions uh, owned by the, the journals. And, and of course, uh, not all of them are free, free access, um, but um, I would be happy to share if anyone uh, would like to, to, to have. And I, I, I would just, uh, maybe close with uh, with what we start with. Uh, you, you mentioned the article that I wrote about uh, the, uh, the Darwin uh, the sexual selection idea was, which was uh, so difficult to accept. And um, this was based on a conference. I was invited to talk uh, about Darwin uh, in, uh, in, uh, when, uh, we're in 2009 when we were commemorating 200 years of uh, Darwin's birth and uh, 150 years by the, uh, for the publication of the origin of species. And uh, of course, I worked on sexual selection. So I was thinking uh, how I can uh, just uh, reach out to other people about um, talking to them about something that Darwin was absolutely exceptional. And um, I ended up thinking, OK, let's try to explain why the whole idea was so difficult that it took so long for even the brightest minds uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the whole world got it so difficult, got it so hard to accept a new idea. And I think this also carries another message, which is uh, some of the greatest scientific ideas, uh, they were counterintuitive, they were difficult, and they did not were for anything. They were, didn't have any purpose besides uh, trying to explain things. And I think we uh, need to understand that uh, science is this effort of trying to understand things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only after we understand them that we can take advantage of some of them uh, to our benefit. Mm -hmm.
Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of your work in the description box of the video, Dr. Gamma Mot. Uh, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to be on the show. It was really a pleasure to have you on. It was a great conversation, I think. And perhaps somewhere in the future, we could have another one if, if you like. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was my pleasure. Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel on February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You also have the alternative of supporting me on Subscribestar or Paypal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Geline, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Ian Haninen and my two producers, Zizar Weber and Rosie. Thank you for all.